Britain talk. So Dynamic Walking is actually not a real conference. Uh, it started off as a bunch of people getting together in uh, restaurants or bars, uh, scribbling on napkins and having a lot of fun. And uh, what we decided to do was just to invite other people to that conversation. Uh, but originally it was really about having uh, random conversations and uh, it was about people spewing whatever random crap came to mind. And then somehow it became something where people are coming and they're presenting actual research, which is really cool, but uh, we thought we would also give some flavor of the kind of random crap that we normally spew. So that's what I'm going to do. And uh, I think Andy's going to do something a little bit better than that. But uh, this is going to be very random, so uh, the outline is uh, not really uh, going to make sense. But the first thing we're going to talk about is uh, scaling, and this is a sort of, re I'm labeling these recurring conversations and fixations because these are things that I can remember talking to Andy about since I've known him. I met him something like uh, at least 15 years ago. Scaling. So the idea is that if you just take a limb and you assume some amount of uh, damping and uh, springiness to it, and you scale it to different sizes that it should affect uh, its behavior. And uh, we did a little study years ago with Ann Patey and uh, Bob Full uh, in cockroaches. And the basic idea is that uh, the natural frequency of a pendulum-like limb should scale with one over the leg length, and then the damping ratio should also scale the same way. This is just based on uh, sort of regular principles. I won't really go through it, but it's, uh, it's just a matter of scaling springs. So a few years ago, I met up with Ann Pitti again, and uh, she talked to John Hutchinson and convinced him to uh, try to do a more extensive study because we had only looked at cockroaches and a couple other things. So uh, the RBC group uh, actually took a bunch of animals. This is a sparrow hawk, and they uh, took the limbs and, uh, from cadavers and they uh, markered them up and actually let them swing freely and measured the free response which looks something like this, so there's an angle versus time, and we just uh, analyzed that to see what the natural frequency and damping ratio did. And uh, this is a list of the animals in order from small to large uh, limb lengths. And then here are the data, so what you see is the natural frequency versus leg length, uh, and then the damping ratio versus length, and uh, the, the red line is uh, with the one over L fit. And uh, you can see that uh, it's, not, it's not a perfect fit, but it's not too bad. So the idea is that, indeed, things like damping ratio are changing with uh, scale. And uh, so that means that smaller animals are probably doing a lot of work against themselves. So they're just doing work to, uh, to overcome the dissipation in their own limbs. And then larger animals have more of a chance of acting like pendulums. So you can probably test this yourself. Your finger doesn't work as a very good pendulum, but your leg does. And uh, that also means that uh, larger animals uh, have a chance of doing more work against collisions and having to fight against gravity. But for little, smaller animals, uh, they have a very different set of dynamics. So we survived the first one, just random spewing. The idea is limbs damping scales with size. Uh, the next one is walking on inclines. And this is really a, a very uh, old topic. So, uh, Margaria described this in 1938. This is a classic curve, energy cost versus incline of ground, uphill and downhill. And this is running and walking. And probably the most notable thing is that uh, the positive work um, of muscle is actually the asymptote for walking uphill. So as you go steeper and steeper, you're just doing work against gravity. And then similarly, if you go downhill, negative 120% is about the efficiency of doing negative work with muscle. Uh, so steep slopes, everything makes sense. You're just doing work against gravity. So this is kind of a mystery, though, is that shallow ground, there is no mechanism proposed for what explains this little curvature here when you're not at the asymptotes. No plausible mechanism. So uh, we wanted to take our dynamic walking approach, which is just looking at these sort of stick leg uh, uh, models with a center of mass on the hip. and uh, you have to redirect the center mass when you change from one leg to the other. And uh, uh, we often like to draw these little diagrams where we can draw how much positive work you have to do and how much negative work 
I'm not going to go through that except to say that if you just calculate that through, uh, you find that the mechanical work you have to do versus the slope has to, the, has to change quadratically. So uh, this is starting from downhill. If you want to power walking, you need to do positive work and that's going to increase uh, like this quadratically up until it reaches um, what we call the end of the transition region and then it's just going to be a straight line. You're just doing work against gravity. Uh, and then similarly as you go downhill, the negative work increases so your collisions are increasing and then you're also going to hit a transition zone. So a quadratic uh, transition. If you want to convert that into an energy cost, you can just take the positive work and move it over here, uh, divide by the efficiency of positive work. And then the negative work, uh, you have to flip it because there's a positive cost in negative work. And negative work is cheaper than positive work. But then you could imagine if you took those two things and you added them together, that you get another curve, which is a uh, predicted energy cost, completely from first principles. And in fact, uh, there are no parameters to this model uh, because uh, you're setting the slope and you're asking it to walk at a constant speed. So that's a prediction for energy cost. Uh, so first we predict that work should increase quadratically with slope, and second we predict that the energy cost should increase uh, with uh, work and with asymmetric efficiency for positive and negative work. So we uh, did some measurements. So this is what we call the center of mass, the work done against the center of mass by the individual limbs. This is the positive work and this is the negative work. The dots are the data points uh, we've taken from a bunch of subjects. And uh, so this is work against uh, the slope. And you can see that a quadratic line doesn't fit too badly. And then what we can do with that is um, we can uh, plot the energy cost. So this is the O2 uh, consumption uh, versus slope. The data points here are uh, what the subjects actually consumed. And then what I'm going to show is first, I'm going to take this work and I'm just going to divide by the appropriate efficiencies. And then if, when you do that and add them up, then you get this line. And then I'm also going to show the other curve, which is the uh, curve uh, from first principles only, not using uh, the data. And that's this other curve. And uh, I guess I would argue that these are, of course, not perfect, but they're not too bad. And especially, uh, there are very few parameters. And this, I believe, is the, um, the only plausible uh, mechanism that is been proposed for the energy cost of walking on an incline. OK, so we survived that one. We think it has a lot to do with collisions. Uh, let's also talk about optimization of step frequency. So this is, again, a very classic curve. The metabolic rate changes with uh, step frequency, or stride frequency. And then the preferred frequency of walking uh, tends to be very close to the minimum. And this is true for all sorts of different speeds. The mystery, though, is, is this a coincidence or is this a real thing? And uh, we've proposed a mechanism for the, uh, the uh, preferred cost. And that is a trade-off between the cost for long steps. Basically, as you take longer steps, you're going to have higher collision uh, costs. And then we also think that it costs energy to move the legs quickly if you want to move at higher step frequencies. And for any given speed, speed is uh, step frequency times step length. And so uh, you have to pay for one or the other. So we said uh, that there should be a trade-off between those two that dictate the preferred step frequency. And uh, so we use that as a means to attack this problem of, is the preferred step frequency actually an optimum that you intend, or is that just a coincidence? Uh, so uh, whether, if it is an optimization, then there's also the question of time scale. So do you learn this over your lifetime? Do you learn this on the order of hours or minutes or seconds? Or maybe this is not something a person learns, but it's something that they evolved to do. So uh, we were interested in that. Uh, so the way we attack this is that uh, Peter Adamchek showed that uh, if you put different arc-shaped feet on the bottoms of people's uh, feet, uh, that you can uh, alter how much collision cost they have. Uh, larger arcs have lower collision cost. And so if you put smaller arcs on people, that will increase the uh, collision cost, basically the long step cost. And then uh, we're saying that this trade-off against the cost of moving legs should yield a new optimum. And so we think that we should be able to move around people's preferred step frequency. Uh, or at least we can move around the optimum and then see if they actually prefer that. 
Uh, so we think humans should prefer that new frequency and that frequency should be optimal. And moreover, our opinion is that people should find it pretty quickly. So we don't think this is learned over uh, that long of a time uh, because you have to make adjustments all the time in life to deal with, you know, you're wearing sandals versus boots and things like that. So there's no reason why we should uh, take a long time to learn that. So this is the preferred step frequency versus the radius of these arc feet, and you can see the pictures right here. And uh, indeed, as we hoped, uh, this is the data point for uh, a bunch of subjects. Uh, it, the preferred step frequency decreases with the arc foot radius. Uh, and uh, here's the preferred frequency for the same people walking in normal shoes. So we can move it up and down a little bit. And uh, so we think that indeed people do prefer a new frequency when you alter uh, the collision cost. Uh, and then what this is, is a plot of the metabolic rate versus step frequency. So what we did is, uh, and I guess these are two lines of interest, this is the preferred frequency when walking in normal shoes, and this is the preferred frequency when walking in these arc feet. Uh, so it's a little bit faster in the smaller arc feet. And then what you see here, these are the data points. This is a representative subject uh, walking at a bunch of frequencies, and you can see that their lowest cost was uh, the same as their uh, preferred. Uh, and then also, we made them walk at the normal frequency that they prefer when wearing shoes, and the cost is higher there than it is in, the, uh, in their preferred frequency. And you can compare that against the cost for normal shoes, where of course this is the minimum walking in normal shoes, and then when we made them walk at the frequency that they preferred with the arcs, their energy cost went up. Uh, so this is true of, uh, we've collected about seven subjects so far, and this is true of everybody. And uh, we hope to finish this up with a few more subjects. But the idea is that uh, we do think that this new frequency is indeed optimal. Uh, the next question was, do they find it pretty quickly? So this is the step frequency versus time. And what we did is the first time people put on these uh, arc feet, uh, they walked, they took a few steps in the lab and then they got on the treadmill and then we had them immediately start walking at a fixed speed with a metronome. So they weren't allowed to choose a frequency of their own. It's possible they could have gained some information during that period, but it wasn't very long. And then we turned the metronome off and said, do your thing, do whatever you want. Uh, and then they generally chose a new step frequency, uh, like you see here, and they did so relatively quickly. Uh, so I'm just going to show a few other curves for some other people. Uh, some people were slower, some people were faster, but generally this took a couple minutes or so. So uh, we've done some fits to these, and generally two to three time constants gives a reasonably good fit uh, if you uh, assume it's a, just a, a linear uh, dynamical system. So people do find a new step frequency pretty quickly. And we would argue that maybe the faster time constants are some form of prediction, where basically you have some experience from prior life, you uh, are starting to walk, you know the speed, and you uh, expect a certain step frequency, which you can uh, seek very quickly. But then uh, over the course of a minute or two, we think that you're actually sensing this new situation, because uh, we, we didn't think people had too much experience before walking on arc feet. Uh, and so we think that this is a sign of uh, online optimization. So we, we uh, think that humans do indeed optimize the frequency. It's not just a coincidence that the preferred frequency matches the optimum. Uh, next, I'd like to talk about non-work, non-energetic costs, because we often are interested in energy uh, expenditure, but of course there should be other costs to human movement that determine our behavior. Uh, this is uh, work by uh, Nathaniel Skinner, who's presenting on some other work to, uh, this week, so I'm going to steal his thunder a little bit and present uh, his main thesis work. So this is a, a recumbent stepper, it's an exercise machine used for uh, stroke rehabilitation, uh, and uh, all four limbs contribute to one degree of freedom. Uh, so you, can, uh, you have many choices to make uh, on how to use your joints and your limbs to do this work. Uh, and the question is, how do you distribute the effort between limbs? And uh, the preference for how you want to distribute that work is not necessarily going to be purely energetic, but it's going to be based on a variety of factors that we don't necessarily know. And we wanted to figure out a way to assess people's preference. 
And we call that a subjective cost. So a lot of people here are optimization people. You uh, have a, a cost function and maybe you would choose to use your arms and your legs uh, and the cost function would have these contours that look like this, where of course the minimum is at the origin, meaning you prefer to do nothing. Um, but the question is, in real life, in humans, how would you measure these kinds of costs? And it's not necessarily uh, that easy because the subjective cost is what determines behavior and it's not necessarily an energetic cost and it's not necessarily directly uh, quantifiable. So here's how our approach is, if you just forget about all the other contours and just pick one, uh, economists like to call that an indifference curve. So you're equally happy to do anything along this line. They're all about the same to you. You don't really care either way. Uh, and the way you can probe this and discover the curve is you apply a motor task. So the motor task is do some sort of work on this device, in this case our new step machine. And what we did is uh, we asked people, we gave them a power meter, that's how, telling you how hard you're going, and we gave them a goal. We said, uh, please uh, exercise to meet this uh, goal, but we cheated a bit. We weighted the arms and the legs differently, so we chose different weights. And so in doing so, we were giving them a motor task like this, so they could satisfy it any way they wanted. And our belief is that uh, the solution they should pick is the intersection of the indifference curve with this motor task. So then uh, we had a little point here. So that should be their preferred. Uh, so, so when they choose their preference, they're basically telling us a little point on the indifference curve. And then uh, you can do that for various other combinations of weights, and then if you do that a bunch of times, then you eventually piece together the indifference curve. So uh, this is what Nathaniel found uh, for a bunch of different subjects and different tasks, different motor tasks. So these are uh, uh, plots of arm, the power that they did. This is mechanical power done by the arms and by the legs. And then each of these uh, little slivers is a data point of uh, showing, and I guess the, the slope of that sliver, the reason why we show it is that implies a tangent. And then the dots or the location is showing you uh, that intersection with the, between the motor task and the difference curve. And then from that, you can sort of back out a, another set of contours, which is our attempt at quantifying a subjective cost which remember is not necessarily energy cost. It's some sort of cost that's meaningful to the person and we don't know what that is. Uh, you can further take that data and you can plot it another way. This is what we call the preferred combination or the subjective preference of the arms versus legs. So this is what people did as a function of how we weighted the task, which is we gave them credit only for the arms or only for the legs or anything in between. And you can see that uh, what people uh, did overall was they followed a sigmoid curve, meaning if you weight the arms more, then they will use the arms more. If you weight the legs more, then they will use the legs more. And I guess I forgot to mention this. This is all implicit, so we're not telling them uh, what the weighting is. We're just saying do the task any way you like. They are aware that the weightings can change, and we ask them to find something that they like, but they don't know what the weighting is. So the idea is that you can uh, encourage them to use different weightings of limbs, uh, even though they're not aware of what, what would be optimal. Uh, so uh, we can influence their preference implicitly, and we think for stroke rehabilitation, this might be a way to encourage people to exercise the impaired limb. So there's a problem of uh, disuse where they can, whenever they can exercise with multiple limbs, the tendency is to favor the impaired one and uh, not give the exercise, which is really the long-term goal that you seek. Uh, so we think this is a way to, to help quantify non-energetic, non-objective costs in movement. Uh, and we also think that this is a way to uh, try to encourage people to have better form in exercise without having to nag them. So uh, if any of you uh, participate in various forms of exercise, you may know that there's a tendency to cheat or find an easy way out and uh, uh, that's why we often pay athletic trainers or uh, yoga instructors or physical therapists. It's, they're, they're, they're our extra conscience keep us honest to make us do the exercise the right way. Uh, this is a way to do it where we are going to be as lazy as we are normally and yet by changing these weightings, 
maybe we can encourage people to, to use the form that we seek without having to nag them explicitly. Okay, so the idea is that there are ways that you can learn about um, other costs that are not necessarily energetic that uh, leads to uh, human movement. Uh, and then the last thing I want to talk about is uh, seeking a co common currency for movement. So here's the problem is uh, in motor control, uh, many uh, people propose different costs that contribute to the, uh, the overall uh, determination of tasks. Some of these include reaching error for reaching tasks. Uh, signal dependent noise is, uh, is a well-known one. Uh, another one is uh, minimizing jerk, uh, the third derivative of uh, position. Uh, many different costs have been proposed. And these are usually uh, studied in the context of trade-offs against each other. For example, the speed accuracy trade-off is one of the most uh, well-studied ones. So you take each of these terms and you do an experiment and you find out how each of these costs against each other, but it's really hard to find any absolute cost. And then you have a problem of there are other things that are very difficult to uh, control in an experiment and to measure. So people don't usually measure uh, the avoidance of pain, which certainly has to affect many um, motor tasks that they could hurt. And then also, in, at least in the motor control world, they don't usually treat metabolic energy uh, as, a, as an explicit cost. So here's the problem with this uh, sort of paradigm, is that none of these have uh, units. Well, I guess they, ha they have units of some sort, but there's no set of common units that you can use to sum these up. So there's a bunch of different coefficients, but all those coefficients basically convert into no units. So that basically means that we have to do everything in a barter system. So that's what the trade-offs are. We know the cost of speed versus accuracy, but we don't know the cost of speed. Now, in our economic world, we have a solution, which is money. And uh, money is, of course, the root of all evil, but it, it's actually useful for a lot of things. And I would claim that we need a common currency for human movement. Uh, and I'm going to propose one, which is energy cost. So energy is going to be existing in practically all active movements. So if you use muscle, then you did something that cost energy. And I know there are a lot, going to be a lot of uh, objections to this. So I'll paraphrase uh, Winston Churchill. Energy is the worst currency for movement, except for all others. So here are some arguments for it. So first of all, as I said, energy always costs. It's a scalar, so that's a really nice thing. So you may believe that muscle force costs energy and, and, or uh, contributes to movement, and that's great. But you have lots of muscles, so you don't have a scalar. Energy cost is a scalar. It's objective and it's quantifiable. It's not always easy to quantify, but you can measure it through uh, various means. Uh, and joules and watts are real units. So I'm proposing that the units for J here should be joules or watts. And of course, energy cost, metabolic energy, is actually sometimes not very convenient to measure. And especially, uh, 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 it's difficult to measure in transient situations. So I say, in a pinch, use mechanical work, which is at least somewhat of an analog to metabolic cost. So uh, I guess the take home message for that is that we can have a common currency for movement, and that currency should have units of joules and watts. So that's uh, just some random spewing, and I, I guess I want to thank uh, many lab members who uh, contributed to, to the various bits that uh, I've shown here, and also a number of collaborators, and I want to thank you for your attention. Basically, decomposing uh, 
you know, underground because that costs the least energy. In fact, then you're returning energy to the world. Uh, but of course, we have other goals in mind, and so uh, those other goals cause us to expend energy. And I think it's it's just like uh, economics. In economics, nobody claims you should never spend money. They just say that when you do uh, uh, want something, you desire an object. There's a tendency to uh, to seek certain things, and money is going to be a, uh, a common uh, term in your overall uh, goal attainment. So, of course you're going to expend energy, but there's going to be a trade-off which says, no, you could, w what if we just sat at home and did nothing? And so, we're always fighting that, 